Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. Hope everyone's having a lot of fun so far at LA Camp. I know it's been really good for me to get to know the community down here a little bit. Um, my name is Megan Sweet. I work for Chapter 3, and we're a um, Drupal shop based in the Bay Area in San Francisco. And I work in our support department, so I am working with all sorts of different sites, some of which we built, some of which we didn't internally, and helping to maintain those sites, to keep them healthy, to add new features, to do development, um, front-end work, kind of a whole bunch of things, training also. Um, so I'm, this presentation today, I just want to kind of talk about my experiences doing support, um, and I, I'm going to be talking about it from a couple different perspectives, uh, from that a little bit of project management. Um, I've done this presentation or a version of this with um, my coworker, Anne Stefanik, and she's our support project manager, so normally she talks about that, and then I talk about the technical side, but I wanted to touch upon some of our practices, best practices around um, project managing uh, the support of a Drupal site, and then I'm going to talk about it from a little bit more of a technical perspective um, towards the middle and the end of the presentation. Um, I wanted to let you guys know if at any time you feel like you're in the wrong session and you'd rather go off and find something more interesting, feel free. I will not be offended at all. I know that it's sometimes you don't really know exactly what level of presentation will be at until you, uh, until you start to hear it. So um, please feel free to do what makes you feel most comfortable. Um, and I think that's it as far as logistics. Um, I'll post the slides at the end so you don't have to worry about writing things down if you're worried about that. Okay, so when you're a developer working with Drupal, there's so much buildup about getting your site live, and you're working on it, you're building it, and your site launches. It's a big, exciting day, and woohoo, I guess we're done now, right? That's kind of the mentality I get into sometimes. But there's still a life to your Drupal site after it's launched, and I think that um, having some kind of clear thinking about how to manage your Drupal site um, after you've gotten to that build point is really, really good as far as getting a lot of longevity out of your site. Um, I have worked with sites before where um, you kind of get into a pattern of, okay, our site launched and now we're going to ignore it for six months. And then, you know, then they have so many problems with their site that they end up needing like really specialized expertise to kind of get them back caught up again. Um, whereas if there had been a little bit more planning and, and kind of thinking around how to keep the site healthy from the beginning, they might not have run into that problem. And I find that the number one thing um, as far as maintaining a Drupal site is empowering your users because what part of what makes Drupal so powerful is that it's a content management system where a lot of people can participate in working on a Drupal site, but those people may have really different levels of Drupal know-how. You might giving people the key, it's kind of like giving the keys to a car to someone who's like never heard of a car before. Um, I think we've all had like an experience like that where we're working with a client that is, doesn't have very much web expertise at all and we're giving them like a fully powerful, robust website and just saying like, go have fun. Um, so really empowering your users to become educated and smart Drupal users can save you a lot of time as a, um, as a person who's responsible for a site. So there's different types of people who may be working on a Drupal site, one of which may be like a web team. So this might be a group of people, say you were, um, built a site for a client and they have an internal person who's their webmaster or web developer, maybe they have a couple of Drupal people on staff. Um, so these people may know Drupal a little bit, they may not. I think it's really important to recognize that learning Drupal takes time. If you're working with someone who is has some um, expertise but doesn't know Drupal, you need to dedicate resources to um, kind of getting them up to speed about how to do things the Drupal way. Um, especially if they're maybe familiar with another development language or familiar with a different CSS, they may be used to doing things one way. And kind of doing some education at the very beginning about how to do things Drupally will end up saving you a lot of time so later on they don't come to you and be like, well, everything's broken and well, you're like, you, you just threw a whole bunch of PHP into a block and that's why. Um, so training and training the trainer, if there's going to be other people who are uh, training their content administrators, making sure that they know how to train others can be a really important step as far as um, getting everybody down the line uh, doing things the right way. Having backup um, and expert level support backup is also 
something that's really uh, beneficial, just having someone you can call and be like, okay, this is over my head, I don't really know what's, what's here, and just having that relationship established from the very beginning so that you don't get to the point where you're like, wow, this, I don't know how to fix this and I have no one to call. So setting up that relationship from the beginning and finding someone out there who can help you, I think is, is really good. And if that means that you're an organization and you find some kind of Drupal shop who can play that role, or if you're an individual and you find someone at a camp who you know, agrees to be there if you have a question, or you, know, you can even use Drupal.org as a, as a potential backup. Uh, effective documentation also goes a long way. If you're providing that to your users from the beginning, then they can reference that um, when they have questions. Another uh, group of users who may be using a site is the content managers. So these are the people who are putting content into a site. And they may have even less uh, Drupal or web expertise than your web team. Um, so this is where training kind of gets uh, jumped up even a, a notch higher. I find that uh, creating help videos is like a really awesome way to educate people. I've had the experience of creating like lots of documentation, here's how you add new pages, here's how you add new users, only to kind of have that ignored and still be getting emails and phone calls saying, okay, I need to add new content and I forget, I know you told me, but I, I just don't remember because it's been several months. And documentation sometimes is just like heavy to go through, but a screencast, like maybe just a minute or two, is a way more approachable way to kind of get people into um, understanding how to do things on their own site. I find that it's especially, like I work for a lot of um, nonprofit clients who may um, have, you know, not, not a very huge budget as far as being able to just hire someone to fix things if, or to do work on their website if something breaks. And so if they have that resource of just having a screencast, that can be a really big difference in whether they can or cannot use their own Drupal site. And then that's honestly what we try to, I mean, that's why a lot of people want to use Drupal. They want to give that people the power to update their own site. And just making that as easy as possible makes a big difference. Um, there's a bunch of like free screencasting tools out there. I use Screener that allows you to do like up to five minutes of free screencasting and then you can publish them elsewhere, like create a YouTube channel or something like that. Um, having a place like a, a frequently asked questions or a forum where you can record questions is another good practice because that way you're not constantly um, trying to answer the same questions. If there's multiple people, they can, people can, you can uh, funnel people towards a place where they can look for their questions first. And just providing effective training materials um, moving forward will save you time in the long run. A little bit about uh, documentation. I had mentioned the, uh, the videos. Doing extensive commenting is another best practice. Um, and I say this even if you're going to be the only person working on your site, leaving yourself comments so that you know kind of what was going on back a couple months ago when you made a decision will save you time so you don't have to figure things out later on. Um, On-screen help is also a good thing to do. You, there's different ways of kind of adding that, like the advanced help module, for example, into your site so people can get answers to the questions as they go along. Or even just providing extra details when you're creating your content types or your fields to really let people what they're supposed to know what they're supposed to be doing, what the rules are, where things go when they publish, for example. Um, and, you know, whenever a question does come up, finding a way to capture that somewhere and put that out there so that you don't end up repeating the same questions. I just wanted to talk a little bit about some support best practices. I think a lot of it, um, other than educating your users, comes back to communication. Um, and having a solid way of communicating with your, uh, with your client or your users is, is really important. Uh, at Chapter 3, we use a ticketing tool. We use Zendesk. Um, I personally find it really useful just to have, it's email driven so that you don't really have to like log on to a site to use it, but just having things um, come in as individual tickets and being able to track threads when an issue comes up is really useful for just like keeping yourself organized. Um, other than that, really, expectation management goes a long way. When a client comes to us and has some request, we try to get back to them as, as soon as we can just to acknowledge that, yes, we've received your request. If it's something quick and one-off, we'll just try to do it right away. But if it's going to take longer, we try to communicate with, that, with the client and say, okay, we're like thinking this is going to take a day, this is going to take a week, you know, and, and kind of like having that conversation over whether something's hard to do or easy to do um, really steps up the uh, client relationship uh, in a positive way. 
Um, and you really should be expecting to do ongoing education um, with your clients as far as needing to uh, retrain them or just train them about new things as they come up. Maybe people are getting more and more into Drupal and want more and more power as they go along to really change things on their site. So just expecting to be able to go back and, and, and help people uh, learn new things is uh, a good way to be doing support. Um, the last kind of bit I want to talk about as far as the project management side of things is a little bit about QA best practices. So we use QA as a way to um, kind of get stakeholder sign off. So for example, we'll say, okay, we're finished building this new feature. We fixed some problem. Can you please QA it? When the client QAs it and says everything's good to go, that is our sign that it's been signed off and, and uh, we're good to move on to the next ticket or to close that ticket. Um, and you know, having good QA really means you should be using version control. You should have your development testing and production environment set up so that you're not doing your uh, changes on a live site. Whenever a client comes to us who doesn't have version control, that's really like the first, or this development server set up, that's the first thing we would like to work with them on as far as getting that um, set up so that we don't have to worry about accidentally crashing anybody's site. Um, and, and kind of get batching work and getting into a regular release cycle is also something that seems to be uh, save us a lot of time. You know, if there's a bunch of little things that need to get done and we need to push some code, trying to group those together so you can just do one, two, three, get it all done and move that forward rather than trying to do one thing here, one, three, and three here a little bit more ad hoc. So now I'm going to talk a little bit more about support from a technical perspective. Does anyone have any questions about the project management stuff? Yeah. Uh, one of the problems I have is keeping track of the photos that have been used on the site. Just, uh, I don't know when I can remove a photo from the server because I don't, I don't know if it's still being used. Are you going to address anything that you know with that? Um, I don't have anything like that in my presentation. Um, but, you know, one thing that can be helpful is creating separate file structures for, like, your different content types as far as where the photos get saved. Uh, Oh, content types. Yeah, so for example, all of the photos that get uploaded through this content type go into one folder, all of them that get uploaded from another content type go into another folder, and kind of separating that out a little bit. All right, the other question, sure. see if we address this. Checkbook files for the content managers, are, are they responsible, do they manage their own checkbook files to know when they need to go and check to see whether some page needs to be updated? Get, I'm sorry, did you say template files? Tickler? Files. Tickler, Tick, like I, uh, I need to do this every other month. I need to see if something has changed on the product. Do you get involved with that at all? I mean, I think, I think that comes down to educating the client as far as like if there's regular tasks they need to be doing, having them have a way to do that. Um, yeah, but I was looking for the CPU tools to use. It sounds like you don't. I mean, um, you know, setting up administrative interfaces, like, could be useful um, if there's, like, a certain thing they need to know, like, if they just wanted to know how many comments are on a, on a certain page or what kind of, how many products they have um, at any given time, creating, like, a view for that. Um, yeah, we can talk later if I, I'm missing your, your point here. Okay. Uh, so a lot of what I do with our support clients is auditing and monitoring of sites. Um, and this kind of takes the maxim um, which I really believe in, which is prevention is better than cure. It's easier to prevent something from going wrong than to cure it once it's already gone wrong. So just by keeping really up to date with your um, auditing your site and kind of keeping track of how things are going uh, can save you a lot of time. So as far as auditing goes, periodic auditing is very important. Um, you know, sometimes you might... Um, forget to kind of schedule this into your overall uh, Drupal support um, methodology. But, you know, depending on how active the site is, how much is changing on the site, taking time to do, even if, it, if it's monthly, if it's quarterly, kind of deeper level audits to really check in and see what's going on. And to make that more easy, um, you know, I like to use a checklist. Okay, these are the things I should be checking um, for my audit. So I'm just going to kind of go over a couple of things that we check into when we're auditing a site. Um, so as far as auditing your code base, uh, the, like I mentioned earlier, the first thing we check for is just version control. Is this site on version control or not? If it isn't, we definitely want to get that going. 
Um, next would be the development server setup. So is there a development site, a test site, and a production site? And how is the flow working in between those? If they don't have development site set up, we will do that for them and kind of create a, uh, a, our own sandboxes to be developing on. And then we'll work with them to figure out the best way to get a test server up so that it mimics the production server as close as possible and kind of work that, that um, system out. And I mean, that's kind of speaking generally because I feel like every situation is a little bit different, but uh, in general, it's just never a good idea to be really developing new features or working on a site on production. Um, checking for hacks. Uh, there's a really great module out there called the Hacked module, which will scan all of the contributed modules and Drupal core on your site and will give you a list of which modules have been hacked. And it will also even give you the diffs comparing, I believe it does. I might be wrong on that, but at least it will point out which ones are hacked. Um, and that is a really great thing to run, especially if you're taking over a site from someone else and you, and you wouldn't really necessarily know whether a module had been hacked um, without running a test like this. So this can save you a lot of time to just kind of bulk test and check and see whether stuff is hacked. If stuff is hacked, then that should be kind of a top priority as far as like unhacking it, which can be really tedious um, and kind of brings up some other questions as far as like whether the site should really just be rebuilt or kind of what the plan is over the long term. But um, in general, you shouldn't be hacking contributed modules or core, so that's an important red flag. It's really important to keep track of custom modules as far as what they do and who's responsible. So if you are taking over a site, um, getting to know the custom modules and the code and having a checking that out is really important, especially if you're going to be phasing out a developer who wrote that custom code themselves and you're going to be there in the future responsible for maintaining it. It's really important to sort of know what they do and whether you fully understand what's going on. Um, as far as contributed modules, just checking for updates and errors is important. Um, are you checking your Drupal logs? Are there any weird errors that are popping up? Um, doing your status update and checking all, Drupal will check all of the modules for you to see what's up to, up to date or not. So seeing if you need security updates or if you're using really outdated versions of modules. And finally, Drupal core. Um, Sometimes uh, I see a lot of sites that kind of neglect to update Drupal core because uh, it can be a little bit tedious, especially if you don't have a good system of version control um, in place. Um, but there's a big difference between updating and upgrading. Um, so it, updating Drupal core is, is it can be as easy as just um, you know bringing in the new, latest version of the of the files, but uh, upgrading say from like Drupal six to Drupal seven is kind of a whole nother beast. Um, so that's something that really takes some thought and consideration, and I'll talk a little bit more about that towards the end. So auditing your configuration. Um, just checking out, if you're looking at a site for the first time, okay, what is their main strategy as far as how they're how they're controlling the layout on their site. Are they using panels? Are they using context? Are they using display suite? Are they using some other method? And are those um, are those techniques being used properly? Did the person who developed the site uh, really understand how to do that? And are they doing something really weird that's going to make things hard down the line? Um, I've seen sites that have de deployed really strange ways of doing things, which kind of cut off easy solutions later on. So you, they'll come to you, a client might come to you and say, I really want to just create a simple slideshow. And you say, sure, we can do that for you. No problem with the view slideshow module. But for some reason, the way they're doing things kind of precludes them from using views. And all of a sudden, it's a really difficult problem where it could have been really easy. So kind of having an idea of whether they've, uh, the site is making things, it's done in a non-Drupal enough way to kind of cut yourself off from using um, maybe contributed modules in the future is a really good thing to know beforehand. Um, also checking to see whether the site has any sort of live updating or feeds coming in um, so that you have an understanding of where that content's coming from and what that relationship is like. Checking the site logs, um, seeing if there's any errors. I believe it's really important to just check out your permissions and roles um, and seeing kind of how under control that is. Sometimes sites will just kind of go absolutely nuts with like dozens and dozens of roles and crazy permission settings. And you know that can be a little bit challenging to manage because if you accidentally give someone more, um, more control over the site than they should have, that can be a big uh, security problem. So checking that out and making sure that things are looking good. Um, and especially the PHP filter, that shouldn't anyone, no one should be using the PHP filter at all. Um, so, you know, if anyone has permissions for that, you should have a really good answer as to why that is. And sometimes people just don't know when they give that filter out um, 
that should be that should be something that's changed. Uh, spam prevention is another good one. You just want to make sure that there's some sort of spam protection in place. Um, Malum is a really good project that um, the Drupal comes out of the Drupal community. Um, there's others out there, other modules you can use. Uh, performance optimization, even just really simple things like um, is the CSS and the and the uh, J JavaScript cached. It's a simple setting you can just check off in your Drupal configuration, but you'd be surprised how many uh, sites don't actually do that at the end of the day. And finally, SEO. The SEO checklist module is a really good tool. It just provides you with a whole bunch of um, checks to see whether you're using certain modules which are really important to SEO. And I believe that that's an important part of a site's health is whether you're doing SEO properly. So I like to look into that as far as auditing is concerned. The last kind of major section to the site that you would probably want to audit is your theme. Um, again, similar to modules, you can check whether the themes are up to date or whether they're security updates if you're using a, a um, contributed module. Also checking to see whether base theme techniques were used or whether the theme was just kind of hacked. Um, having an understanding of how that is being done um, will tell you sort of how the site needs to be maintained over the long term. Another thing I like to check for is there like crazy custom PHP logic in the TPL files. As a general best practice, if you're doing PHP logic, that should be in your template.php file, not in your template TPL files. Um, but that's something that not necessarily everyone knows. So checking that out because that can kind of make things tricky if you're trying to maintain your, uh, a site you didn't build. Checking out what libraries are in use as far as maybe some jQuery libraries that are there or and the CSS structure. Is it just one huge CSS uh, file? Is, there, is it broken up into multiple CSS files? Um, just having an understanding of that and kind of how it was developed is important. Uh, responsive, obviously there's so many different techniques for responsive websites right now that um, checking out how that was done is really important to know. And you know, th there's always gonna be red flags and I think um, sometimes you just kind of get an intuitive sense that things are a little bit crazy. Maybe this doesn't look exactly like I've seen other Drupal sites look. Like if there's like 400 TPL files or something, you'd be like, wow, that's going to be kind of challenging. Uh, beyond uh, auditing, uh, monitoring is another thing that's important as far as support goes. Um, I believe that most of the time um, when there is a major problem, say you have a white screen of death, a site is down, something is like, ah, emergency. Uh, a lot of the recovery time is just trying to figure out what broke, you know, and if you know what broke, oftentimes it's just a simple fix. Okay, let's just go in and do this. But if you don't know, that, like that is what takes the longest is just trying to troubleshoot and, and problem solve. So that's why this kind of auditing kind of leads into monitoring, like understanding the site really well um, will help you monitor it better. And, and having a sense of your trends. If you don't really know what the trends are on your site, then you don't really have a point of reference to compare whether things are out of whack or not. I mean, obviously, everyone knows that their site should be live, and if it isn't, that's a, that's a trend that's broken. Um, but there could be other things that you could look for um, as far as whether things seem like they're normal or not. So a couple of monitoring best practices. Um, you can use the syslog module, which comes with Drupal core, to actually write the Drupal logs to a text file. So that way, if you are locked out of your Drupal site, you still have access to what kind of what is sh showing up in the logs. Monitoring your servers um, is obviously something that's important. Um, if you don't, if you aren't a, a really strong systems admin, having a good relationship with your hosting company or knowing someone who is is, is always a good idea. Um, SE, monitoring your SEO can also just kind of point out whether something's wrong, like your site just kind of drops off the face of Google while well, maybe something's going on there. Maybe there's like a, some problems, some errors that you're not really seeing at first. Uh, consistent cron jobs, um, obviously a good one to uh, make sure you have set up on your site. Using something like total admin control or creating administration views is another uh, way to kind of check out what's going on in your site. So for example, you could create an administration view that just tells you, okay, how many nodes are on my site, how many comments are on my site, how many users are on my site, and if you see something, just jump out of whack. Like you have, you know, normally you get maybe 10 comments a day and all of a sudden you have like 10,000 comments. Like you're like, whoa, something's really wrong. Like I'm being spammed or something's going on here. So, but if you didn't really know what your trend was, you might not really know that that was a you would even see that. So I, I like to use, uh, the total admin control has some of those kind of basic um, 
statistics available for you, but you can also create those views on your own. Kind of cool project I've uh, been turned on to recently is DrupalMonitor.com. It's a free, free as of now service um, that you can just plug into your Drupal site and it will give you a bunch of statistics uh, as far as just kind of keeping track of some simple monitoring. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, are your admins educated? Are, are people who are using your site doing things the right way or do they have like too many permissions? Um, a lot of times um, it really comes down to the types of people who do have power on your site to mess things up. Um, so making sure your admins are educated is really key. Uh, best practice is generally every time you have an issue, start to monitor it. So if something does come up that causes something to break on your site and you do kind of get into an emergency, okay, what was the cause and how can I monitor that in the future so that it doesn't happen again? And as you start to get, you know, as you start to recover from issues, you get a list of things that you should be keeping an eye on. And if you have a simple site and you, you know, even Google Analytics can be a, just a good tool for monitoring as far as like our site traffic completely dropped off, maybe something's wrong, or um, just kind of keeping track of the, what your trends are uh, using that tool or any other analytics tool. So uh, security review, uh, it's another important part of support. Um, most security holes are created in the configuration and the theme. Uh, Drupal um, as a whole is a pretty um, is a pretty secure code base as long as you don't do things that make it insecure, which is oftentimes done through the configuration or the theme. Um, so, like I said, permissions, roles, keeping people out of where they shouldn't be. Um, but there's another really great tool out there called Security Review Module, which will scan your site for a bunch of really common mistakes people make when they're configuring. Uh, just a couple examples coming out of that are, for example, what are your file system's permissions? Um, is there, do uh, people have access to files on your server that they shouldn't? Import formats, super key as far as security goes. You shouldn't be giving people access to just like full powered HTML um, unless they're an extremely trusted user and even then it's probably not the best idea. So um, security review module will just like scan your input formats, but that's something you can also do manually and, and really understand, okay, who has what power to, to input, you know, just some random JavaScript onto my site through a comment filter. Um, scanning your content as far as your nodes, comments, and fields. Um, is there anything there where people can put things in that they shouldn't be? Uh, checking for error reporting, um, private files, are they really protected? And I would just say that this is even kind of gets a, a, a degree more important if you're working with sensitive information, like if you have an e-commerce site or you are collecting personal information about people, you know, then you're really dealing with something beyond just, um, you know, your site going down or being hacked, but you're dealing with potential problems with people's personal information being leaked. And if you're going to take that personal information and in, you're responsible for, for treating it properly. So um, really having an idea of how security is on your site is something you should be checking into really frequently. Um, the allowed upload extensions, you know, it's really important to limit that to really what people sh can and can't be uploading so that they can't just upload some crazy random script to your site. Um, database errors, failed logins are a really good thing to, to know about. Are people trying to log into my site? Are they trying to hack into it? That kind of just leads into whether your username and passwords are secure. You'd be, you'd be surprised how many times I see a Drupal site where the password is something like so obvious and you're just like, that is a real problem that needs to change. So having secure passwords, you know, you, you shouldn't be just be using like, at, your root user shouldn't just be like admin, admin or something like that. Um, if it is when you're developing, make sure you change it before you go to production. Another kind of common one is passwords included in user emails. Drupal does that by default, but you can go in and, and change. So when someone needs to reset their password, what Drupal will do by default is send them their password. Um, once a password has been sent through email, that's an insecure connection. So you need, it's better to just provide a link that links someone back to the site to change their password rather than sending them the actual password. So just going out and it just deleting that line um, from the emails um, is something that you should do right off the bat uh, if you haven't already. And finally, PHP access. It's something that you really should be limiting. Um, it, some people have a tendency to want to be able to just put PHP into a block or put it somewhere on their site through the um, configuration, but I, 
personally, I really feel like PHP should only be in your in your code base. It shouldn't ever enter. It should never be stored in the database. So it should never be inputted through the the GUI. Um, and so just keeping track of that is really important. So training is key. Drupal uh, users need Drupal awareness. All of these things I just went over are things that like. You know, I didn't necessarily know all of them. I'm sure there are still things out there that I don't really know or security flaws that I may do in my Drupal configuration, but it's, uh, you know, we're all kind of responsible for educating each other and educating new Drupal users as far as like making sure things are uh, done in the proper way. So you may have a problem. It may happen that, you know, even though you're um, doing a really good job of maintaining your Drupal site, uh, something might come up. Um, a really common one is spam. Um, I've had sites that I didn't have proper spam protection and I log in and I have like 10,000 new nodes. I'm like, okay, great. Um, so just protecting your um, spam as far as um, using Mollum, using CAPTCHA, um, like I said, using creating administration views to just know how many comments or how much content is on your site so that you know if something's out of whack. Um, that just comes to understanding the trends of your site. Um, but spam you should be using for any kind of like Spam protection should be used anytime someone, an anonymous user, is putting anything onto your website. Um, and something maybe you don't necessarily know, but like your, if your site is sending emails, if it's um, if it's doing anything with the users, all that there's potential for spam to be entered into that process as well. So keeping track of that is good. Um, another thing you could do if you have a problem is, is use your version control system to check the diffs. Um, if something has, someone has gotten access to your, um, to your code base, uh, having an idea of what changed is good. Um, you know, or if it's just maybe someone else who's been developing on the site and did something and broke it, um, even if it's not some like malicious hacker, just being able to go roll back, uh, be able to roll back to a, a version of the, your code base that you know works is super valuable. I mentioned the hack module, but that's another gun, good one because you could run hacked module, see if a module has been hacked and revert back to the original contributed module. Using the security view module, looking for spam in your content itself. And finally, I would just say having a good hosting company. Um, I, I think that oftentimes, you know, there are a lot of things that can go wrong from a, a site owner's perspective, but there's also things that can go wrong from a server perspective that you're not necessarily responsible for. Um, as a site owner, so having a hosting company that you have a good relationship with that you know you can get support from if something goes down, that they're letting you know if they're having problems on your site so that you're not thinking it's you. Yeah. What do you use the kit for? <laughs> That's just a feel good because when your site's down, sometimes you get into this mental site, uh, this mental state of oh, you know, and and when you're so upset, you almost like don't know what to do. <laughs> so. You know, having, you know, a site you can go to to look at cute animals to kind of calm you down, be a little bit more clear-headed, you know. I feel like that's a good tool. <laughs> it's true, though. You know, I think um, the more frantic you are, the easier it is to not see an obvious solution. So just kind of, like, keeping calm and going on is a good, trying to just be like, okay, sites do go down. It's okay. I'm going to figure this out. Um, and and you know trying to not get too stressed or not let your clients get you too stressed because when something happens all you can do is just try to fix it and there's nothing more you can do at that point so security and module updates this is something that um i deal with a lot in in the support department as far as keeping sites up to date um Drupal, oftentimes people have the, um, the setting left on so that when they are browsing or using their Drupal site, um, in the, um, as an administrator, you will get those messages at the top of your site that say your site is out of date, you need to update. And sometimes those happen so much that you just start to straight up ignore them and you know re refresh, okay, it's gone, I don't feel bad about that. Um, but I think that really keeping on top of updates is super important um, because the more you let your site get out of date, out of date, out of date, the harder it is to just be able to come back to a solid state. So keeping up with it, I would say every 30 days is a good benchmark as far as you should check in, okay, do I have any security updates and take care of them. Um, you know, not every, uh, not every time a module is updated is going to be because of a security problem. Sometimes module maintainers up create a new feature or they're just improving documentation or something is changing that's not necessarily a security vulnerability. 
So when you check your status report, the red ones are the security updates. Those are the big red flags. Yes, you should definitely do that update. If it's yellow, that's your signal of like, okay, maybe this is optional. So what I normally do is read the update notes. So every time a module is updated, usually the module maintainer will write a couple notes about what changed. So you can go and check that out and be like, okay, um, this is a new feature that I really want, actually. I'm really glad they updated this. I'm going to go with the new, newest version of that module or mm, eh, less important to me. I'm going to wait until it's a security update and, and, and not really need to update this one right now. Um, if you were to find a bug in a contributed module, that's something that you should let the module maintainer know about. Um, if you feel savvy enough as a developer to submit a patch, that gives you like a million more bonus points. Um, and you can provide that to the module maintainer to make the uh, module more secure. But just getting familiar with the issue queue, being able to log on to Drupal.org if you don't have an um, account there, I highly recommend getting one. Um, just to be able to have conversations um, in the issue queues when you do run into problems. Uh, it's a generally really strongly um, believed in maxim in Drupal community that you should not hack core and there are no exceptions. Um, because if you start to hack core, you start to end up with something that isn't actually Drupal anymore. It's really your own version of Drupal, which means that you're responsible for your own version of Drupal. Um, but if you're running a clean version of Drupal, then there are tons of people who are all equally responsible for maintaining that code base. So, you know, in order to take advantage of that, you have to be responsible enough not to hack things, even if it feels like that's the easiest way to do it. Um, if there is some exception out there where you just absolutely have to make a change, then you should do it responsibly by creating a patch and keeping track of that change so that you don't accidentally override it later on. Um, that kind of relates also to planning for uh, custom modules. So if there is custom content, custom code on your site, someone has to be responsible for maintaining that and that person may be you or maybe the person who wrote it originally. So having a plan for that so that when you do need something to change about that custom module, who's responsible and um, so that things just don't get, there isn't a problem later on and you don't really know who to call. And lastly, just staying in tune with advances in the, in the community and the, and the modules that are out there. Things shift in the Drupal community. One way, we may have been doing things one way a year ago, and now someone came up with a solution and another solution that people are moving towards. Coming to events like this and just kind of keeping track of what people are talking about is a really good way to sort of stay up on what the uh, best solutions to problems are. Um, uh, there has been almost like no times where I've actually honestly had a question about something in Drupal, Googled it, and gotten like no results. Almost always, if I'm having a problem, someone else is too. So if you're having a problem, chances are someone else is also working on that problem. So connecting with people in the community and helping to contribute are ways to kind of keep, the, um, keep Drupal really strong. Uh, version upgrades. This may be something that a lot of you already are familiar with, but I think it's just worth going over if you're if you're a little bit more new to Drupal. It may be not that intuitive, but go, jumping from various Drupal is broken up into versions, and when it's in different versions like Drupal seven versus Drupal six, there are significant changes. So if you are a Drupal six, you have a Drupal six site. Um, you may be like, cool, I want to go to Drupal 7, that sounds great, let's go. But it's actually not quite as easy as just pushing a button or switching your code base. Um, there's a lot of things that change about how Drupal actually works. And so going from a major upgrade is something that needs to be planned for pretty significantly. Um, that really just comes down to timing. Um, maybe you're already considering a rebuild and that's the time when you decide, I'm going to go from Drupal 6 to Drupal 7 and I'm going to rebrand or I'm going to totally redo my site architecture so that you don't have to worry about doing a complicated uh, upgrade before necessary. If you're on Drupal 6 right now, you don't necessarily need to go to Drupal 7. Sometimes that's something that people don't really understand, but it's not necessary just to go to the latest and greatest. If things are working great for you on Drupal 6, it's not going to be until you, we really are strongly into Drupal 8 where people kind of stop paying attention to Drupal 6. And at that point, you may be wanting to redesign your site anyway. Or if it's static, you may just be happy with the way things are. So. Um, yeah. Um, you would have to go through seven. Yeah. So, but you could do that in one process. Like you could do it all together. Um, and another, yeah. What would you say the best practice? You already have to six, and you would call seven, um, seven different server, different 
Do that yeah. You're going to want to test it out um, because, it, and there's really extensive documentation on Drupal.org that will literally walk you step by step. Like, here's the first thing you do, here's the next thing you do, and you can follow that, but I would not do that on your production site. I would, like, have a separate version of your site on your local computer, work things out, get it working there where it's safe because it's not, it, it's definitely not as, like, clean cut as just a click of a button, so... Uh, just another thing I want to mention, if you're, if you're a little bit more new to the Drupal community and maybe you weren't around when we went from um, Drupal 6 to Drupal 7, um, I know sometimes people get really excited when the newest version of Drupal comes out and they say, I'm so excited for 7, I'm just going to wait for 7 to come out and then I'm going to build my site. So I'm just going to like, you know, it's supposed to come out in January, I'll build my site then. Um, something that's good to know is that when the newest version of Drupal comes out, there still is a catch-up period afterwards where all of the module maintainers and the theme maintainers have to go and rewrite their code in order to work on the newest version. And so some modules will have a, a release for the latest version of Drupal right when it comes out, but oftentimes, even if that's there, there will be some bugs that kind of need to be worked out as people test it out. So I would say a, a safe waiting period is six months. Um, so if you're trying to plan for a new Drupal site and you're thinking Drupal 8, you know, might be coming out, I would say we're, we're going to be at least another year or two before it's like super solid. Um, and we're really at that point with Drupal 7 now. There's, you know, they pretty much never build a site on Drupal 6 when they're starting fresh. Drupal 7 is stable and there's pretty much nothing you can't do in Drupal 7 that you could do in Drupal 6 as far as contributed modules go. Um, but that's just something I wanted to throw out there for you, those of you who may uh, be kind of new. So your community connection, connecting to the community, I kind of already mentioned how, you know, just keeping up with advances and knowing what's going on in Drupal is really good, um, that there may be new modules out there that solve your problem even better than you realized you could. Um, going to groups.drupal.org and signing up, there's like so many different groups you can sign up for and be on the mailing list, like any sort of odd interest, like librarians at groups.drupal.org, nonprofits, like themers, uh, site builders, like total noobs. So really, you know, connect with your community, connect with other people who have, are trying to develop similar things as you, connect with people who are going, you know, have the same sort of scenarios or the same sort of problems and you can learn from each other. Um, knowledge, internal knowledge sharing is really important. One thing we do at, at chapter three is just all get together, all the developers get together once a week and we just chat about like, hey, what's new? What have you been working on? You know, what is the latest and greatest in Drupal? And that's a great way to really keep up with, you know, maybe someone's doing something that a, a really great way that you had never considered. Checking out your user groups and meetups, going to camps and cons. You guys are already here, so you don't really need to um, push that too much. But I would um, plug right now that Bad Camp is coming up. Um, it's going to be in November, uh, November 4th first to the fourth, and there's going to be like several days of free Drupal training, and there's going to be a bunch of summits on different topics like mobile and business and UX and nonprofits and higher education, and then there's going to be like the um, weekend of, of sessions, so it's a really kind of fun and very educational opportunity like this camp is to uh, get to know Drupal. It's called Bad Camp. Yeah, Bay Area, Drupal Camp, yeah, so B-A-D. Camp. It is. It's in Berkeley. Yeah. November 1st through the 4th. And it's totally free. So that's great. Just got to get yourself there. Although there's also scholarships if you need scholarship help getting there. And if anybody uh, wants to talk about Bad Camp at all with me through the rest of the camp, I'm, I'm helping organize it this year. So. Um, if anybody in the room wants to do training, for example, find me. <laughs> okay, my last uh, topic here is taking over another person's work. So I've been kind of talking about that throughout, but just a couple key takeaways. Doing a really extensive discovery, this is really important. If you're taking over a site from someone else, you need to understand how that site works. And so it's not just so simple as saying, okay, I'm the new maintainer. Uh, you really need to build in some time to get to know that site, figure out how it's working, and um, you know have an opportunity to have maybe have a conversation with the previous developer if that's possible about some some of the decisions they made or some of the way things work. Uh, reading documentation, hopefully, 
Um, if you're taking over a site, there is some documentation um, about, you know, especially if there's custom modules or if there's um, stuff in the theme, you know, stuff that you can reference as far as under getting a good understanding. Talking to all stakeholders, if you see red flags, if you're taking over work and you see something that's going to cause problems later on, you know, having conversation at the beginning will save you from later on having to say, well, it's not me, it's you. Um, so getting that out there and, you know, getting a really clear line of sight as to the priorities for the site, where do they want to go with it, um, what's kind of the laundry list of stuff that it needs to get done, and kind of getting a sense of the direction the site is going uh, is all important. So I'd say my uh, key points today uh, is that Drupal sites need continual love and attention. You cannot just neglect them and expect them to still be happy and healthy. Um, you really need to be checking in with your Drupal site over the long term. Uh, keeping your documentation fresh is really important. There's no point in having documentation that's completely outdated. If you change something that's referenced in documentation, you should be responsible for updating that so that the, your future self and future people working on the site have an idea of what's going on. Using good communication, feedback, and QA tools keeps things running really smoothly. Um, fostering Drupal talent is another really key one. You know, when people are new to the Drupal community, they need help getting into it. They need help getting over the learning curve. Um, you know, we're, that's part of why what makes these things like this camp so awesome, um, just helping people get into Drupal and when they're new or helping people learn new things, um, hear from different folks about stuff they're doing. So. Um, and lastly, the, the community contribution, I always try to stress this um, with Drupal, that there's a, so many ways to get involved and you don't have to wait until you're a super awesome Drupal core contributor to really contribute to the project. Even just keeping a blog about how you do things, adding documentation to Drupal.org really makes the project that much better for people who are, are new. So that's all I have for you guys. Thank you. And uh, I'll take questions. Megan, I was just going to add something for the gentleman who asked about the upgrading version. Please, yeah. Is, uh, as you mentioned, it's important to keep us separate because Devin Ryan is also want to remember that you want to also back up, keep, keep clean backups of your, both your code base, like your PHP and JavaScript, and also your, uh, your database, whether that's my SQL or whatever. Just, as in, I just want to add. That's really, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, you always want to be able to revert back before you start making changes. You want to have a safe place to go back to. So that's great. Thanks. Yeah, everything. Yeah. If anyone else has other like suggestions too, I'm more than welcome to inviting a discussion. Is there a suggested way that you could uh, lay out as far as how you go from the database push on development to testing? Um, yeah, so databases and files um, should never be moving upstream, which means they should never be moving from um, your development environment to testing to production. It should only be moving the other direction. So um, what that means is that when you start on your uh, development site, you should have your most updated database, um, but, th but that database should never move back to production because things are happening on your production environment that if you were to override it, you would lose. And so that there's like two flows, basically. Your code moves up as you update your code, and your database and files move down, if that makes sense. Yes, but then if you're on the development site making nodes and making changes, yeah. and you then get this on production without editing your own um, You can edit. At that point, you would need to, to edit production in the sense that you would need to create those, those content types or views over again. Or you could use, um, you know, you could export um, some of that, the features module, um, is, it helps you to do that as far as uh, taking some of that configuration and putting it into code so that you can push it forward. Um, and that's really where the testing environment comes in because you have your new stuff you've been working on, new modules or new code, and then you have your production site and they, they may, you want them to mirror as close as possible, but at some point they're going to be outdated. So your testing environment is where you say you pull your most recent um, your most recent database from production and your most recent code from development and you test it out. And you're trying to mimic production as best as possible. Are things going to work? And if it works on test, ideally it will also work when you go ahead and do it on production. So it's not completely um, fault safe, but that's kind of the best you can do, I think, in most circumstances. There's a question here. When you mentioned um, Drupal by default, you Yeah. 
It's it's a configuration change. So if you go into, I can't remember the exact drop down, but you, yeah, yeah. There's a configuration settings where there's um, a, like a text box for what gets sent out to the user when they request a new password. And so you can just go in and just take out that line that it's a token for the password. You just delete it. Yeah, uh, the alternative, and this is already there also, is to provide a hyperlink that links back to your site, which allows them to log in from their email. So if you're familiar with resetting your password on other, on other websites, that's usually how it works. They don't just send you the password so you can log in. They actually send you a link to reset your password. Um, and so Drupal does that for you already, but they also include the password. So just taking out the password part is really all you need to do, and it'll still be functional. It's just, it's all through the, um, through Drupal configuration. No, not the back end. Yeah, it's like the sites, it's under con the configuration, it depends on whether you're in Drupal 6 or 7 as far as what the drop down is, but um, it's like sites, site settings or something like that. Yeah, yeah. And it has all the different email templates that it's using. So just find the one, any of them that have the password in there, just want to take that out. Yeah? Under all the teams, you said um, to, uh, uh, check uh, libraries to see if the files that are being used. But how can you tell if they're being used? Is there any tool that says, because sometimes designers will throw things in there, and then, but, but they get carried on, and they should, they're not really being used. Is there any tool that you're in a way to tell that? Mm, if anyone knows of a good tool for that. Um. And there's always, if you have a, t a development environment, then you're always free to just comment it out and see if anything changed. <laughs> I mean, you can just check your, um, this is where like creating an administration view, for example, or just checking um, what, what your users sorting by role for all your users and seeing like if no, none of your users have a role then you can assume that that role is not in use. Well, I, mean, I, I mean, where the role's been changed from default. Oh. Like, maybe I'm, I'm, again, I'm new here. Yeah, yeah. In Google, you can define, I use Google. Defaults. You can change roles to give them extra capability. Yeah. And I'm assuming that that would have that. I feel like there, there may be a module out there that, like, helps you maintain defaults, but I don't. I've never used one, and so it, since it's like so, the permission system is so exhaustive and so custom, it is a little bit tedious to keep track of, but, yeah? Yeah. Um, if I understand correctly, I mean, I think, well, I like to always, like, have them um, listed in order of, like, anonymous to most super user, so that way you have, like, some progression that you can look at, and then I like to kind of create the permissions as I go along, rather than waiting till the very end, so, like, you know, if I'm, cre if I create, an, or if I create a new content type or something, just going in and, and choosing, like, the new, if there's new permissions around that, sort of as you go along. Um, as far as like the way it's actually displayed, I think there's some modules out there to like help you reorganize your permissions page a little more because it's kind of like huge. But 
I don't know if that answers your question exactly. Mm -hmm. Right. I see. Right. 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 Um, I haven't necessarily seen that as a trend, but I don't. I think that could be a really good solution if you need kind of something nuanced. Um, but what I tend to do is really try to keep it to a minimum as far as roles go. And so, like, if for the most part, like. If I have a client that just needs to do content editing, for example, I will give them like a simple content editor permission. And then I'll say, okay, here are like the keys to a higher level account. You only use it when you need to, you know, but it has like closer to like a super admin level. Yeah. All right, well, thanks guys. I'll be up here if anyone has questions. Yeah. So I'm interested in that camp this morning. Great. I'm just playing like a couple of hours and I probably need a scholarship to go up. One day I'd like to teach. But yeah. I mean, so should I just give you my info? Or? Yeah. Do you have a card or yeah. want to write it down for me? That'd be great. Hi. Hi. My name's Carrie. 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 And I work for one of your clients, the digital media. Oh, cool. Uh, so I'm the. I'm like their only Google person at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm I'm maintaining like three chapter three sites. Cool. I never got a handle. A handoff would have been really nice. Yeah. I really never got a handoff with anybody. So I hope that one of these days I'll get to go up and kind of make some of the developers and some of the sites that I need to. Yeah, definitely. But, definitely. Uh, I'm hoping I might be able to get to the yeah, I just want to say hi. It's so good to meet you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Put a face to a name yeah. and everything. Yeah, so it's nice yeah. to meet you. Bye. Great. Hi, Mickey. Thank hey. you very much. Yeah. Awesome. Good to meet Appreciate you. Uh, I don't know how to ask it, but Sure. Just uh, the, um, the development, like the, the I guess we're producing the website mm -hmm. and then the testing one. Which one's the live one? I mean, I oh, yeah. The terminology like, is a little how, weird. Yeah. How do you, because I'm over developing local, right? Yeah. And then from there, once I have all that set up and working, and that I have to work put it on a server. Right. right. My, my hosting right. company. Right. Right. So, so sometimes there is, yeah, just your local, and then there's your your server, which people call production, or they call live. Either kind of name is uh, exchangeable. Um, and then, you know, your development, you could call it your local, you could call it your development site, you could call it like your development sandbox. Okay. There's kind of a various names for that. And then oftentimes people will actually add a third one in the middle, which they call either testing or staging. So that's local or is that on the server? That's on the server. Okay. So, so that's... You have like a different domain or something like that? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Exactly. Okay. And then, um, so it might be like your domain, like staging dot your domain or something like that. Right. Okay. But um, that is the place where it's like as close to production as possible. Like you want it to be the ideally on the same server or on that very similar server. Right. So that, cause sometimes, you know, there's a difference in the way the server is configured right. based on compared right. to local. Okay. So their staging is your opportunity to really test it as close to production as possible without having to push to production. Okay. And then if things work there, that's also where you can do QA, okay. you know, with your client and be like, okay, is everything working here? Check it out, final sign off. And then you push to production. Okay. We're, we're starting to, um, I have a non-profit that we're starting to play around with. It yeah. We want to just get into it. Yes. You know, so this is our first time just kind of getting into it. So thanks a lot. Sure, and sure. I love your blog, by the way. I saw your blog. It's like all about the little test and how to ask. That was pretty cool. Oh, cool. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, I also just wanted to tell you if you're um, looking for just some, like, overall understanding, um, Pantheon is a, a cool project, and you can – it's a – Drupal hosting, but you can sign up for a free account, and it will all, it will create for you like a development, a testing, and a production. Okay, and that's servers. Sorry, was, that's on Drupal.org. It's um, getpantheon.com. If I tweet you, 
Yeah, I'll send it back. Do you have payment that can you control the Google site right away? Yeah, totally free. free. With wow. free environments, and it yeah, even has like yeah. uh, Git included, and so like if you're not that used to version control, you can just do like clicking Git. It's like awesome for people who are like trying to get a handle on it. Um, they do charge you if you want to use it as like your main hosting, like if you want to have a live site. But yeah, you can totally use it just to like develop, and then when you're ready to launch, you can just export your whole site on your database and throw it up on your server. So it's awesome. Yeah, yeah getpancat.com. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. I, really, I want to say I really enjoyed your site. Um, we, I run Google Services before it's open source. And yeah. We've been doing Plum, but all of you covered very nicely all the different things you should be thinking about. And I really appreciate it. Cool. Well, great to meet you. Thanks for coming. Yeah. Hey. Good job. I think mine's like 20 minutes. Oh, cool. What are you What are you doing? Sweet. Because I just did mine like last week, so I'm just going over that. Yeah. Hopefully, it helps out. Yeah, totally. That's so That's so useful. Um, I will let you jump in here. <laughs>